Please take your Bibles and turn with me back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3. It's uh, been a long time since we've been in Exodus 3. I don't know if you recognize that or not. The last time we were in Exodus 3 was June 10th. Uh, June 17th was Father's Day, and I preached on Who is Your Father. June 24th was the Youth Rally Sunday. Enoch walked with God. July 1st was Independence Day Sunday when the wicked beareth rule. Before that was May 27th, Memorial Day, the Divine Memorial. June 3rd was Communion Sunday, Sanctification in the Cross. So it's been a few weeks since we've been looking at our series on your new job in Exodus chapter 3. That text that we read just a few moments ago is key to the passage that we are discussing, the things that God called Moses to do, and we have been seeing a parallel in what God has called us to do. At the moment of our call, at the moment whereby we entered into a personal face-to-face -face relationship with God, at the moment of our salvation, God began to communicate to us through his word what he would have us to do as Christians. We have a job to do. We have a calling that has been placed upon us. And you will recall that the key to the new job that he gives us to do when he calls us into his service is doing the will of God. Easily summarized in just a few words, doing the will of God. His will is revealed in his word. So if you would follow what God wants you to do, the first place you have to start is with the instruction manual. You recall that we covered in lessons 13 through 15, of the last time we were together in part five, the different things that are here in the text, we covered the will of God for all believers as set forth in the scriptures. Of course, there are additional details that God makes clear to us in his specific will for us as he brings us through life. We don't all move together as a unit, all the believers all over the world. He's taking us from New York City, now he's going to move us to Kansas City. And then we all, all of a sudden, are moved out to California. And then all of a sudden, we all get on a big, huge boat and carries us to China. God has specific individual direction for us, but all believers have specific things that are given to us in the Word of God so that we might understand the direction that God gives to each one of us and the special role that we are to play within his sovereign plan. We saw that if we would obey the general commands that are given to all Christians, that then God would reveal to us the specific things that relate to us. We saw that the goal of God's will for every Christian is Christian maturity. For full service, we noted that it took 120 years for Moses to grow up. 
full service during those last 40 years, but he went 80 years before he got in the center of God's will. He went 80 years before he began to do what God had actually called him to do. If you're a Christian, it should take a lot less time for you to become one who is in the center of God's will because at the moment of your salvation, you became permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit entered into you and began to work on you to conform you to the image of Christ. He uses God's word to do that. That should be our prayer for one another that we grow to full maturity. For example, Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. And here's what he prayed for them, what we should pray for one another, what our goal should be to reach, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Lesson 14 was God has a perfect will for every believer that includes service not just sitting in the bleachers watching the game. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee. The coach tells you it's time to get off the bench. It's time to get into the action. Whatever the position God has called you to be, he's putting you on the playing field. You say, but coach, it's a lot nicer here on the bench, especially at the end where the water bucket's located. It's hot and sweaty out there. You know, I'd much rather sit up in the bleachers eating hot dogs and popcorn. Come now, I will send thee. In the body of Christ, there is no room for spectators. We have all been called to service. A few moments ago in the prayer, I prayed for those who have become discouraged, for I have heard some of that in recent weeks. Those who are ready to reach for the bench, those who are ready to go out and watch everybody else play the game. Dear people, as long as you're alive here, you're in the game. You may be doing a lousy job of playing the game. You may just stand there as the opponent runs by with the ball and you sort of look at him as he goes by when it was your job to tackle him. So, well, I've tackled other guys in the past. Why do I need to tackle this one? Because you are in a spiritual war, not just a game. Because you are involved in the service of Jesus Christ, who not only has given you a command, but he also gives you the power to fulfill any command he gives you. Never say I was too weak. Never say I was too tired. Never say I was too busy. Never say I was too occupied. He has given you an assignment. And it is not to sit and be a spectator. You say, but I'm discouraged. Well, that's one of Satan's best tools. Satan wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to pull out of the game. He wants you to sit on the sidelines. It opens the field for him to do his nefarious work. You've been called to be involved in the game. God's perfect will for every believer includes service, not just sitting and watching the game. We noted that the word serve occurs 193 times in the Bible. The word service occurs 116 times. Many other related words occur hundreds of times more. We all like to be the boss, but none of us like to be the servant. But the New Testament makes it clear that if we want to follow Christ, we will serve, not sit. Serve, not sit. Let me say it again. Serve, not sit. We will serve Christ. So let's focus on the practical. And I'm going to tread on toes, I'm sure, in the next few comments that I make. But let's be practical. If we've been called to serve and not sit, what are you doing around here to serve Christ? There are some who are doing a lot. There are some who are doing more than their share. There are some who are covering the bases for two or three other people should be in the game. You know, I periodically clean this auditorium. Don't do it as often as I would like, but uh, I do clean the auditorium. I go around, pick up trash, pick up bowl bulletins, pick up occasional few communion cups, so I'm thankful to the children who help with that after the communion service. Pick up candy wrappers, pick up water bottles, pick up torn up scraps of paper that come in little tiny pieces. I found some over in this section here this last week. They're still there. What are you doing to serve Christ? 
I find hymn books and Bibles scattered around on the pews rather than being put back in their racks. And so when I come in, I put those back. It, the person who took it out would take only less than two seconds to put it back, but I walk up and down each of these pews here and stick the hymn books back where they belong. Walk up and down and put Bibles back in the racks where they belong. Discover that some of the hymn books have migrated from one section to another and the, there's a spot where it's empty and I go around and hunt for the other hymn book which somebody has carried someplace else. Folks, these are humble things to do. This is service, but you know you could help after the services. It's not much, but it does save an hour to sometimes an hour and a half of the pastor's time. If you would simply pick up your own trash, put your own hymn books back where they belong, put your own Bibles back where they belong. If we all work together, we'll find that it becomes very light work. What are you doing to serve Christ? I find things that are personal items that are left behind here. Sometimes they're left in the pews, sometimes they're left in the prayer room, sometimes they're left out on the table outside. And then I'm called and asked to monitor it for another week so somebody can come and pick it up. Dear friends, as Jesus put it to the disciples in the garden in Matthew 26, verse 40, and he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Friends, this is not a movie theater where you sit for two to three hours without complaining, eating popcorn and drinking soda pop. And yet, some don't understand that. This is where we're gathered for worship. To paraphrase Jesus, can you not sit through one service without eating and drinking? If you really must have food and water to survive, then sit near the back of the open sections where you can go in and out and eat in the lobby and drink in the lobby without disturbing other people. Your new job includes service, and part of that service is worship. But we have been called to serve. We have been called to serve. Could you make a few phone calls each month to a shut-in? Or could you even visit a shut-in once a month? Could you follow up on neighbors that you've invited to church? Or perhaps you've never invited neighbors to church. Could you invite a neighbor to church? Have you prayed and asked God to give you some creative ways in which to serve Christ in this place? Well, let's have report time. About a month and a half ago, um, we had our track distribution Sunday. And here on the platform, we had packets of tracks set out, four per packet, nicely clipped together, thanks to Brother Bill Bailo, point of his service, for which we're very thankful, as he prepared those for us for track distribution Sunday. We still have a few over here in the basket. Between 45 and 50 people took those tracts with a promise to God that they would pass out at least one tract per week over one month. Four tracts, one per week over the month. Some of you all here took those tracts. Let me ask you, how many of you passed out all four tracts over that month-long period? Anybody? We have a few. We have a few. You didn't make the promise to me. You made the promise to God. We made that clear when we encouraged you to pick up tracts here. There are things that could be stuck in a bill as it was sent away. There are things that could be left in a public place. You go to the grocery store, you leave a tract on the shelf or hand it to the cashier. Dear people, if we don't sow seeds, we can't expect crops. If you don't plant the seed of God's word, you can't expect anything to grow. Can you serve Christ by passing out tracts? Yes, I think so. Even if it's the feeblest of attempts, 
If you have the grain, the faith of a grain of mustard seed, how big is that? Jesus is talking about the smallest of seeds. You have a supernatural power when you have the Word of God. That's what's in the seed. The seed is the Word of God as Christ describes it in the parables. Your job is to plant seeds. Serving Christ. Part of that is our witness. So have you been serving God over the past month? Did you know there is honor and reward for those who are servants? Servants? Listen to what Jesus said. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. You want to be chief? The way up is down. You've heard me say that before. It's a phrase that you ought to memorize. The way up is down. The way up is down. That's Matthew 20, 27, Matthew 23, 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. The way up is down. Matthew 25, 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. God has given you certain talents and certain spiritual gifts, and we're going to be speaking about that as we get to the end of this message. He gave a bunch to one, fewer to another, one to one. And that fellow, though he wasn't responsible for much, didn't do anything with it. Say, I've got, I've got very, very little talent to serve God. Okay, what are you doing with what you've got? Because you have something. The Bible says so. What are you doing with what you've got? Do you bury it in the earth? Or do you multiply it? Maximize the talent that God has given you. Maximize the gifts that God has given you. Maximize the resources that God has given you. Maximize the influence that God has given you. Maximize the time that God has given you. Maximize the witness that God has given to you. God has given you something. Jesus says... There is great reward for those who use what God has given to them. Those servants who serve. The book of Revelation talks about that's what we're going to do in eternity. His servants shall serve him. Don't think the high and grand and glorious and mighty ideas. It's a matter of serving as a servant the king who has called you into his service. Mark 9.35, And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Mark 10.44, And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. There is a reward and a blessing for those who are willing to serve, not sit. Every one of us here has something that he or she can use to serve Jesus Christ. The servant heart should be the attitude of every Christian. 2 Timothy 2.24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all, apt to teach, patient. 1 Corinthians 9.19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. The servant heart is a reflection of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a, say it with me, servant. Let's try that again. Servant. Let's try it again. Servant. Took upon him, this is God himself, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He became a servant, and now every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he is Lord. The way up 
is down. You remember that? The way up is down. Jesus himself has set the example from heaven to earth in the form of man as a servant, dying the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The one that wants to be chief, the one that wants to be first, shall be the servant. The servant's heart is the heart of a Christian who is walking with God. We have seen in the evening service that the first way in which God calls us or sends us to serve is in worship. We saw how that applied to us today with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. That's the reason that we have a morning worship service, an evening worship service, is because worship is our primary service to God. We saw that our service of worship is to a holy God, and it includes how we dress with our best. Not with immodesty, not with slovenliness, not with attention-grabbing clothes, trying to draw attention to ourselves, with modesty. We saw that the service of our worship to a holy God includes the music that we use. It must be holy. It must be reverent. It must not be a carnal imitation of the world with religious words. We saw that our service includes what most folks think of as very mundane. But the necessary work that facilitates the worship, taking the offering, cleaning the church, ushering, caring for the grounds, the personal property of the church, and so on, putting things back where they belong when you take them away. There are verses of scripture. We studied all of that stuff. We saw that our service includes the building and repair of the buildings used in the service of God. That's going to be one of the themes that we see this week in the summer Bible school. We saw that that includes those who do the actual work, those who oversee the work, and those who are responsible ultimately for the work. We saw that our service includes the work of the ministers and the elders compared to the work of the priests in the Old Testament but we're all a kingdom of priests and therefore are all involved in spiritual service. We saw that our service includes a distinct order for each person involved in the service of worship. Each one had a specific responsibility to perform. We saw that our service of worship includes our giving as an act of worship, and we've talked about that at the time we take the offering. It's not only worshiping God, but it also is to provide for the needs of needy Christians. We saw that the church can learn from the worship of Israel in serving God. We saw that our service of worship includes the individual and personal presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice. It's the responsibility of every believer to present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're talking about the will of God, remember? It involves the presentation of your body for service. This is where it all starts, folks. If we would do the will of God in serving him. If you try to use your body for things that are unholy, things that are unclean, you're an unclean vessel, and you will not be fit for serving the Master's use. We saw that we must not give our service to worship other gods. Our service includes serving one another. And the job description of the entire body of Christ is to meet the needs of other believers, to serve them. Now we have new material for today. And I think it's very important because it ties in exactly with what we've been talking about. Lesson 15. Our spiritual job of doing the will of God is based on a divinely, not humanly, but divinely perceived need that must be met. It's just like a factory that's geared up to market demands. At different times in history, there have been a demand for different kinds of products, different kinds of goods, different kinds of services. The same thing is true in spiritual history. Now, if you live back in the Middle Ages, there was a, a demand for making chain mail. Nobody wears chain mail anymore. There's no longer demand for that, except perhaps in Hollywood, where they probably make it out of plastic because it's lighter weight and not so hot. 
during different periods of history, there have been different needs. And so there have been different focuses on what needs to be provided. Different soldiers with different skills to fight different kinds of battles. Well, here we're talking about the divine perspective, divinely perceived needs. And then God assigns his servants to meet those needs. At one time, there was a great need for Christians to come to this country because there were people here in this country, what we call Native Americans now, who had never heard the gospel of Christ. There are certain countries where the gospel was freely spread, like England, for example, or Germany. You know what? Those are countries that now have a great need for the gospel because it is almost totally obliterated by modern secularism and the influx of Islam. Massive numbers of Muslims all across Europe, not just in North Africa, not just in Saudi Arabia or Iran. There's a tremendous need in many parts of the world today that perhaps in the past didn't have such a great need for something, but now they do. You know, when we lived in Alabama, not far away was a brand new Mercedes-Benz factory. They produced the M-Class Mercedes there at that factory. And um, we took our children on a tour of the factory. And it's magnificent, it's beautiful. I mean, ultra-modern, obviously billions of dollars put into this place. And they have a nice visitor center and so on, but they take you through the assembly line. And you have to walk inside these yellow lines that are painted on the floor, and you're walking down and watching these robotic arms do different things to different parts of the car. And, you know, a door gets uh, placed on here, and then a robot does bong, 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 bong into that door, and, you know, whatever else is going on. And so they said, now we want to take you and see our parts room. And you think, man, for, a, for a, an assembly line like this, that must be a gigantic warehouse, four or five times as big as what we've got here. They took us to a parts room that was about the size of the right hand side of this stage up here. That's how big their spare parts room was. And the guy just smiled at us and he says, you see, we have on-time delivery. He says, we know what's coming down the line, what colors the cars are going to be, what kind of, uh, you know, padding on the interior they're going to need, or what kind of fancy thing they're going to need on the steering wheel and all that. And so we have distributors, so why should we keep all these parts in stock and have all that money tied up? We have people who produce the windows, and we have people who produce the little handles that you crank them up, or in this case, the electric motors that run them up and down. We have people who produce the floor mats and so on. And we have doors all along the assembly line. So our computer knows what each one of the cars is, what condition it's in, and where it is on the assembly line. And it sends out a message just in time for those people who have the parts they have to show up at our door as that car passes the door. The parts are taken off and downloaded onto the car. Whoa. Now we think that's impressive. God is far more impressive than that. God is never late with anything in all of history. God has precisely what is necessary not way too much that sits and gathers cobwebs. Not too little to actually meet the need. Though sometimes we as his servants waste what he entrusts to us. Still doesn't take God by surprise. God will make sure that his will is done. But we will be held accountable for not doing what we should have been doing when we should have been doing it. God is a much better general than Satan. As the spiritual warfare rages around us, God knows precisely which troops should be in precisely which location at precisely the right time with precisely the right equipment and with precisely the right resources to more than countermatch whatever Satan's attack will be. Nobody sits on the sideline in the spiritual war just being excited about how neat the movie of history is. If you're one of God's children, he has put you on the assembly line, if you will. You have a specific job to do with specific resources that God entrusts to you. 
so that you will ultimately accomplish the purpose that God has assigned you to do. Are you doing it? God has called us to serve and not to sit. God knows what is needed and he knows how to solve the problem. Verse 9, I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them and I'm going to do something about it. I have a person that I'm going to send to take care of the Egyptians. Moses, it's you. God has a divinely perceived need that he has placed you here in this church at this time of history to fulfill. God doesn't waste his resources. God doesn't waste his soldiers. God has you here at this time so that you can fulfill a purpose that he has for your life. Not someday just to say, well, Lord, it was fun being down there, but here's your talent back. I didn't use it. I wrapped it in a napkin and placed it in the earth. Lesson 16, putting all of this together, our spiritual job responsibilities are part of the great spiritual warfare going on in the heavenly realm, but played out in the temporal realm. That brings us to Lesson 17. God chooses and empowers leadership in each realm of world conflict and spiritual conflict at the right time and the right place to accomplish his eternal purposes. Folks, we believe in the sovereignty of God. At least we theologically say that, but we live like we don't believe it. We believe that God is sovereign Lord over the universe and over our lives, but we live as though it's all out there and it's not related to us. God has not only a purpose, but he will empower each and every one of us to accomplish his eternal purposes in us and through us. Think about the heroes of faith in the Old Testament and think about the others who have followed them. There's Enoch and there's Noah and Abraham and Esther and David and Peter and Paul. And then we move, we got Luther and Calvin and Knox. And we've got Bach and Mendelssohn and Handel. We've got George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, Douglas MacArthur, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, bet you never heard of him. David Ben Gurion, I hope you've heard of him. Dr. Carl McIntyre, Ian Paisley, multiple others. Oh, you've got to come and, and hear this series this week on the survival of Israel. Against all odds, Israel survives. People, do you understand that in 1948, May 14th, at exactly four o'clock in the afternoon, David Ben-Gurion stood up and read the Declaration of Independence of Israel. Within two hours, eight Arab nations that outnumbered Israel 400 to one, within two hours, they attacked. At that moment, Israel had one tank, two Piper Cub airplanes, and three cannons. For every four adult men in the nation of Israel, there was only one gun between the four of them. And most of those were what we used to call zip guns. Nobody makes zip guns anymore because nobody has antennas on their cars, but, but zip guns were made out of the antennas on cars. You could shoot one bullet and then the gun would blow apart. Put a 22 bullet down that thing and work a little trigger mechanism and you could shoot a bullet out of it. That was called a zip gun. A lot of their guns were zip guns. And they won the war. Israel is a nation today because of the sovereign power of God, not because of the capabilities of men. Oh, it's the history of Israel is filled with things like that. The British soldiers who were pulling out at the time, who had left behind all the armed garrisons to the Arab Legion, they were riding home and saying, well, in a couple of hours, mom or dad, it's going to be over and the Jews are going to be annihilated. There is a sovereign God who rules history. And he rules your history just as well as he rules the history of national Israel. Never say, I don't have enough, I'm not able, I can't do it. You will see some incredible film footage of tank battles, for example, where Israel 
with four tanks came up against 1,400 Arab tanks and won. It's impossible, people. But there's a God who lives and who keeps his promises. And you serve him. Or are you sitting on the bench? Will you be among the victors who march with pride or will you hear the words unfaithful servant? God will empower you and he has already by his indwelling Holy Spirit if you have trusted Christ as your Savior you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. If you're led to do something carnal you know it was not the Holy Spirit who led you to do it. If you're led to do something sinful you know it was not the Holy Spirit who led you. We have been called to serve and not to sit. You know, although men get credit for their accomplishments, it is really the invisible hand of God that is directing their personal lives and the world events around them. And that is true for us too, folks. God uses humble people who recognize their own inadequacies. Look at what Moses said here. Who am I? The entrance into accepting divine power and accessing it is to admit our own inadequacies. That's where God brought Moses before sending him to Pharaoh. That's where Moses had to come to before he was used to lead God's people. That's where Moses had to come to before he could stand at the edge of the Red Sea and stretch out the rod of God and the sea parted asunder and the children walked over on dry land. What God commands, God empowers and enables his servants to do. He says, certainly I will be with thee. Did you know we have a command to that same effect? What God has commanded us to do, he will enable us to do. Mark 16, 15, Jesus speaking, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Acts 1, 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Ye shall receive power. He sent them to go into all the world, and he said, Ye shall receive power, and you will go unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Matthew 28, 20, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. That's the same thing that God at the burning bush said to Moses. I will be with thee. I will be with thee. Jesus says it to us. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, folks, is that a great promise? We look at that with Moses and say, Moses, why didn't you believe him? I mean, God's appearing to you at the burning bush with the Shekinah glory. You're in the middle of the desert. He grabs you by the scruff of the neck. And he's going to make something out of you. Why didn't you believe him? Why do you question him? Why do you go down there and waffle? Dear people, the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the one who spoke to Moses at the burning bush, has said, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We are just like Moses. We waffle. We question. We want him to send somebody else. We're scared. We don't do it the way he wants us to do it. Moses struck the rock twice. God gives clear evidence of his call and his command. For us, that is the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts. Jesus said in John 14, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. 
The promise of Jesus Christ in John 14, that great passage that we always quote at funerals. Dear folks, Jesus is talking about more than funerals. He's talking about your present empowerment by the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. There are two kinds of spiritual gifts. There are temporary sign gifts. There are permanent service gifts. The early church had the temporary sign gifts. You do not have them, and neither does anybody else, even though the charismatics fake it. The seven sign gifts, the ones that were only available prior to the writing of the New Testament, were apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and knowledge, which was the reception of new special revelation that had not yet been communicated by God. We don't have time to go into all of them. I do want to pick up at this point, though, next week. But the church today has 15 service gifts. There are seven sign gifts. That's the stuff that the charismatics focus on, and they're all wrong in relation to that. But there are 15 service gifts, things that are called charismata, just like those sign gifts are called. There are 15 listed in the New Testament. There's the gift of evangelist. There's the gift of pastor-teacher. There's the gift of teacher. There's the gift of governments, and it has nothing to do with the secular state. There's the gift of ruling. There's the gift of helps. There's the gift of faith. There's the gift of wisdom, different from the gift of knowledge. There's the gift of self-control. There's the gift of discerning of spirits. It has nothing to do with telling whether or not somebody is demon-possessed by looking at their bloodshot eyes. It has nothing to do with that. The gift of giving. The gift of ministration. The gift of exhortation the gift of mercy, and the gift of hospitality. Did you know that that special word for spiritual gifts is used of every one of those things in the New Testament? Did you know that the Apostle Paul tells us that every one of you has been gifted with at least one and probably more than one of those gifts? That's what God has entrusted to you, Ephesians chapter 4, to build up the body of Christ. If you're not exercising your spiritual gift, then you are failing to do what God has called you to do. You are not serving him with what he's entrusted to you. You are like that steward who took the talent, wrapped it up in a napkin, and buried it in the ground. That's serious business, folks. I think you've seen that as we've looked at these other passages today. God has called us to serve and not to sit. God has called us, even with the most humble of gifts, to serve. And it is as we serve in humility that he exalts us. Remember, how do we get up? The way up is down. The way up is down. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The way up is down. How important that is. And the Lord willing, we will pick up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It's convicting. It's very convicting. We don't like to hear it. No doubt there have been thoughts running through our minds as to the excuses that we want to give, as to why we're not. We think we're physically incapable. We think we're too old. We think we don't have enough money. We think all the different things that we use to say, I will disobey whether you like it or not, dear God, because here I am and I want to do my own thing. We resist you, and we confess that as sin. We confess as sin our excuses because when you've given a command, you also give the power to do it, and you always provide the resources that are necessary just to take the next step in obeying you. Father, you've called us to this church. This is where you've placed us, and you always place a full complement of the gifts in every church. And if we see a lack, it's because we discover there's someone not using what you've entrusted to them, not doing what you've called them to do. Father, we pray that you will humble our hearts, that you will make us obedient, that we will take seriously your call upon our life, your call to serve. to serve our Lord Jesus Christ, and by love to serve one another. And so we commit your word to you, Father. We pray that it will not return void, 
but that it will accomplish that which you please and that will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.